Good morning, everyone. We are glad to begin this side event that is titled Successes and Progress on Article 6 Implementation Experiences from Pioneer Countries. This side event is jointly hosted by Senegal and by the Click Foundation. And yeah, I would like to hand over and invite uh, Madame Madeleine Duf, Head of um, Climate Change Division of Senegal's Ministry of Environment, uh, Sustainable Development and Ecological Transition, to give us our welcome remarks. Please, Madeleine. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and good to see you all here in this room uh, with us uh, in, uh, in this room uh, in order to discuss Article 6. I know that we all are uh, excited to have more uh, information on how it's going along in, uh, 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 in many countries who are concerned by uh, 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 Article 6 implementation with the support and the collaboration with the Swiss uh, 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 government. First, uh, allow me uh, to, to also use this opportunity to, to thank the Swiss uh, government uh, and also to, to thank the uh, uh, Click Foundation uh, regarding his collaboration with uh, different countries who are here. Uh, we're looking forward to having uh, 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 the first feeling of countries and also having uh, some uh, expectation from uh, the audience here uh, uh, how uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this concrete, because it's a concrete way of doing articles is, is moving along. So uh, I will not be long. So on behalf of the government of Senegal and on behalf also of the different uh, uh, countries concerned by this uh, uh, collaboration with the Swiss government through the Click uh, Foundation, we are looking really uh, to have great conversation in order really to see how we can do things better, but in order also to see how we can also really show to the world that Article 6 uh, can be uh, really a uh, win-win uh, 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 solution for, uh, uh, for, for our countries, for all the communities. So I will not be long. I will give a floor to Sandra, who will uh, moderate and, 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 and go through the uh, the, the agenda, and also we start. Yeah, I think time is short, so uh, yeah, in order really to ensure that we, we have great conversation, uh, I make it short. Thank you. Thank you, Isula. Thank you very much, Madeleine. And yeah, please hand, now hand over to Sandra Greiner, West Africa Climate Alliance, who will be our moderator of this event and guide us through the program. Sure, I have my own microphone. <laughs> so good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much to the organizer. Thank you so much, uh, Madeleine and uh, Olaf, for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great uh, to have you here with us on a, a Saturday morning at this hour. Um, and we will hear today on uh, successes and progress of um, Article 6 implementation from some of the most advanced countries currently in uh, Article 6. So we have... Um, a uh, great panel. So first we will hear from um, host country and uh, government representatives uh, from Senegal, Ghana, Thailand and uh, Switzerland. Then after that we'll uh, shift our panel and we will have on our podium um, project and program uh, developers and uh, buyers in Article 6 from, um, who are active in the same countries. Um, so um, Excellent uh, panel, very uh, excited uh, to hear uh, from all of you. Uh, given that we have um, uh, yeah, a, a long list of panelists, we will be a bit uh, SB opening style, so we will have very short interventions. I will have uh, one question for each uh, panelist, um, so that uh, hopefully at the end we also have uh, the opportunity for some um, questions from uh, the audience. And... Um, 
with that, let me uh, turn to our first um, panelist. Um, on my left, um, Mr. Um, Andrea Camponogara, uh, who is, um, uh, has recently taken over as leading the uh, UNFCCC's uh, regional collaboration centers. And um, the RCCs, of course, are very active in Article 6 uh, readiness uh, support. So the question to, um, to you, Andrea, is um, uh, what do you see, um, what are the key readiness needs of countries that you're engaging with? And um, where should they perhaps start? What are the, the first priorities? Over to you. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, everybody. Let me just thank Climate Click. This is the first time I'm speaking in public since my appointment as global coordinator of the RCC of the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat. So it's a, it's a honor to be here. Let me just a few words on the RCCs. Um, six regional offices, two in Latin America and the Caribbean, two in Africa, one in Dubai for uh, MENA and South Asia, and one in Bangkok covering South uh, Asia and the Pacific. We provide support to countries with their obligation under the Convention, Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement, and with engagement in processes, mechanisms that are established under these uh, treaties. Article 6, of course, since Glasgow, is one of our top priority. We, are, we have been, for the first time, mentioned in parties' decision, so decision 2 and decision 3 of CMA 3 in Glasgow, uh, clearly referred to the RCC as a key instrument in the region to deliver the capacity building program of 6.2 and Article 6.2 and Article 6.4. So to that extent, we have deployed Article 6 expert in each uh, RCC since almost a year. So what I'm going to tell you now is the result of their uh, uh, engagement with stakeholders, government representatives, NGOs, organization, uh, uh, and the society at large, I would say. So I had a call with all the Article 6 experts last week just to prepare for this uh, um, intervention. So I'm going to list the key needs that they have been identifying during, uh, I would say, the last six months. And the first one is what they observed in almost all the region, with exception, of course, of front runners or most advanced countries, a lack of basic knowledge on Article 6. There is really little people in the country that knows what is a carbon market, what is Article 6, and uh, particularly in those countries where that was either none at all or little engaged in, uh, in the CDM or in the voluntary carbon market, the capacity in the country is to be built. And not only a government representative, particularly uh, when it comes to Article 6.4, where we'll see a major in, uh, engagement involvement of private sector. There is a, little, a, a lot of work to do across the whole uh, society at large. When it comes to government, one uh, institutional arrangement is really weak. It's, uh, there is no clear role mandates of uh, what to do, in, uh, what to put in place about Article 6, both 6.2, 6.4, and uh, this is another area of work where all the efforts on capacity building should, uh, should focus. Um, there is a need of addressing the discussion on Article 6 in a programmatic structure way, particularly create link with the NDC. So it's the first time that uh, uh, carbon markets is requested to be linked with a national strategy. So this is an, another area where we need to, to provide uh, good support. And one other aspect, which is main um, country specific to some extent, and I'm referring to SEEDS and LDC, that are usually less attractive to donors, investors, or uh, let's say developed countries when it comes to support uh, program or engage in, in carbon market because of high associated cost, of course. They are exposed to climate, uh, adverse effect of climate change, so a high risk political risk. So uh, this is a, an area where capacity building has to, to focus. 
looking forward, and I'm, uh, I'm closing, so the need of, there is a need of programmatic approach. It's, it's, the journey just started. The SB is working a lot in establishing the full package of, uh, for, for the 6.4 to, to become op operative. Principal criteria, methodology will be delivered in, uh, in future, so there is a need of starting now with a series of capacity building modules and continue um, in, in future. No more underrepresented countries. So but there is a really a need to focus on countries that have never been engaged in carbon markets, and despite they might be not attractive, we have to focus on that. We need to change approach to training. So no more academic discussion or a serious uh, or history of decision taken by parties on Article 6.4. We have to go on the ground practical. Country want to know. What, how I have to write a letter, how I have to communicate to the, to, the, to the secretariat. And last but not least, sharing among countries. So alliance, the carbon market alliance we have in some region has to be replicated in others because we really allowed sharing of in information and experience between countries, a south-south exchange that need to be nurtured and, and strengthened. And they close here. Thank you very much, Andrea. This was... Uh uh, really a great overview for kicking us off. And now we would like to hear from our first uh, host country. Um, and I'd uh, like to invite uh, Mr. Papalamin Diouf, um, who is from uh, the Climate Change Division uh, of uh, Senegal's Ministry of Environment, Sustainable Development and Ecological Transition. And uh, as you may know, Senegal has recently uh, validated its Article 6 uh, strategy. And I think uh, we will... Uh, now be uh, yeah, privileged to have a first look at uh, how the Article 6 strategy of uh, Senegal looks like. Over to you, Papalamin. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Good morning. My name is Papalamin Jou from Minister of Environment of Senegal. And uh, thank you for Click Foundation giving us this opportunity to share our experiences. Uh, my presentation, my communication will be focused on our step in Senegal in implementation at ICSIS at national level. And first, uh, allow me, Sandra, to, 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 to recall our national context before, because in Senegal we are, since 1994, we are well committed in the implementation of uh, climate change. We have signed and ratified the UNFCC Convention called Kyoto Protocol. Paris Agreement. Uh, we have also put in place uh, an appropriate uh, governance framework with the Minister of Environment, which is national national focal point. We is also the DNA for for CDM and the ND for GCF. We have in this framework National Committee of Climate Change uh, put in place by presidential decree, and in this. National Committee, we have a subgroup who is dealing on market mechanism. Also, in, the, in, in, in terms of, of, of policies, I think it's, it, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are doing well. We have prepared all the documents that we need to do. We have our communication, national communication. We have our binary update report in progress. We have uh, our study on carbon tax in progress also. And finally, we have our NDC in 2020, which is now our reference document in terms of implementing climate change at national level. And in this document, we have some targeted sectors, which are energy, AFOLU, waste, and transport. In these, we have two components in our NDC. We have unconditional and conditional, and it's the global cost is estimated to 13 billion of, of, of dollars. Next, please. Uh, before going straight on this point, the governance framework we have under Articsis, we need to know under, before, before Articsis we have CDM. And in this CDM, I think Senegal is, have reached a lot of, uh, have lot of experiences and we have a lot of success in, in, in implementation of, of, of the CDM. We have a lot of projects who are registered on the CDM, on the energy sector, on, on cook stove, on, on mangrove, on a lot of sector. 
And in this CDM, we have, I think, in 2024, we have established our, our, our DNA for CDM and develop a ministerial additive to, 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 to manage market carbon under, under Protocol Kyoto. And these actions have helped us to, 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 to be ready uh, for, 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 for putting in place uh, government framework under Artixis. And for this, we have in, in our NDC, I think it's clearly stated that Senegal will use carbon market to fulfill our conditional NDC. I think it's, it's, a, it's a, an important point to, we need to, to focus. After this, I think, uh, like other countries, we have our, our ND for 6.4. For it's the Minister of Environment. It's already done. How you have said, we have developed a strategy on, on Article 6. It's already validated. And now we are discussing on modalities of implementing of recommendation of these studies. We are in the process of uh, developing a ministerial authority on, on national framework on for Article 6. It's on the process, not already designed, but in the process. And as I said, we have on COMNAC, National Committee on Climate Change, we have a technical commission who deal with carbon market, and it's chaired by our colleague, May from Asia. Please. In Senegal, I think we, we have started implementing Artixis before, uh, before COP26 when we, we have the adoption of this. And we have signed with Switzerland and, and bilateral agreement. Uh, we are on the process of, of the signature of the MOPA, the mitigation outcome purchase activity between Click Foundation and uh, National Program on Biogas. We are on the process. I think uh, it's well, well, well going. We are also in the in the in the. Uh, we have signed an, an, an agreement with Japan, also on, on GCM, and we are on the process for 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 Norway, Singapore, and and, and Korea. I think it's uh, some step we are we are we are we are, we are doing, and it's not only only uh, signing some bilateral agreement. I think it's 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 uh, it's about I think uh, implementing concrete activities, and with the World Bank on the initiative PMI partnership for market implementation, we, are, we, will, we will do some, some activities on, to, on readiness of Article 6. We have also the West African Carbon Alliance, GGI, who have stopped us on the strategy, and click UNDP with, I think we will, we will do some, some other activities. You can go straight, please. As I said, yes, it's not only bilateral agreement, it's about project, because I think it's good to have some bilateral agreement to have some project. But the, the, the most important thing is to develop project, and we are on this way. We have some, some project on biogas. Bio bio the mud is already validated. MOPA also. We have some other project on transport, on energy, on waste. I think we have it's five projects on the on the on the on the on the list and it's going well and we are waiting for for other projects with with click. Okay, on the on the uh, ancient framework, I think it's more important thing we need to to focus. We have uh, some recommendation from the Article Six strategy. On these, we have the establishment of the steering committee, and uh, with objective to. Uh, to define strategic orientation, to negotiate, validate bilateral agreement. We have also technical committee. And after we will have the carbon market office uh, in the Ministry of Environment, we will provide that uh, doing some technical issue. I think that this is the, the, the arrangement, instrument arrangement that Senegal has will, 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 will propose for, for validation. It's in the, it's in the process. And finally, we, yes, it's the same. It's the steering committee you have in the. It's in French. All my apologies. All. <laughs> we have COPNAC, Com National Committee on Climate Change, and the Carbon Office in the center with some profile in terms of legal aspect, reporting, and communication. Uh, final slide. I think it's uh, the next step. I think we have already done. I said our our strategy, our some projects, some pilot projects, some agreement. But we need to go deeper. We have some other things to do. It's uh, timeline, it's fees, it's uh, um, carbon registry, 
and I think with our partners, we will, we will, we will, we will take into account this, this, this aspect. Thank you. I think it's done. <laughs> Great. Thank. Thank you so much, Papalamina. I think this uh, looks all, all already very impressive, and we'll uh, look forward to studying it uh, more deeply. Um, now I have the pleasure to turn to our next speaker, Mr. Uh, Kun Supanut, um, who's um, a legal officer and manager at uh, the Thailand uh, Greenhouse Gas Management Organization, or TGO. And uh, Thailand, uh, as we know, is all also a front runner in Article 6 uh, implementation and, um, for instance, uh, has successfully authorized a program on um, uh, e-buses in uh, Bangkok. Um, so for you, um, the question, um, what are some of your consideration for Article 6 programs in Thailand? So looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and also thank you to Senegal and to Click Foundation for inviting um, TGO to provide our um, experience, to share our experience um, with regard to the first authorization and how we prepare our own national process, the institutional arrangements, as well as, as you mentioned, policy consideration um, in order to implement um, Article 6. So uh, I would like to start off with... Um, the, the, the process that we, when we start to think about engaging in Article 6, uh, we look into what is the, the necessary um, process, what the necessary arrangements that we need to have in place in order for us to be able to operationalize um, the, the Article 6. Um, so the, the first thing we do is to set up um, what we, we call within our country the carbon credit management guideline and mechanism. Um, it's simply the guideline adopted at the level of the National Committee on Climate Change, um, specifying the, the relevant um, considerations, the process um, with regard to our engagement in carbon market, um, both in terms of domestic arrangements as well as in terms of international cooperation uh, with partner countries. And um, within this gui guidance, we also specify some initial criteria uh, that we used to, to consider whether the, the projects, um, whether what kind of activities that we would want to provide authorization for. Um, and the criteria including some principles such as that the, the, the activity um, have to be the um, something that we, we would not do domestically to our domestic plans to ensure that it would be additional to, to our NDC and would not undermine our ability to achieve our own target. Um, we also look into um, the, transfer, um, the, high, uh, um, the transfer of advanced technologies and the projects that would require large amount of investment that the private sector might not find um, feasible um, doing it implementing it on their own, and also other criteria that we use. So within the, the first project, um, what you mentioned, the Bangkok eBus program, um, these are the, the, uh, the initial criteria that we use to assess and um, to see whether they align with, with, with what, um, what we, we want to authorize as the, the pilot project. And I, I think it's also important to also look into the sustainable development contribution of the project as well. And we think the Bangkok eBus project is really timely in the sense that um, for, for Thailand in, in, the bank, in our capital city, the ba um, Bangkok, uh, we have an issue with regard to the PM 2.5. Um, so we, we think that this project have a very significant in terms of helping us um, also in the sense of social co-benefits coming from, from, from this project as well. So that's something that we also take into consideration uh, when we provide our first authorization. So within this, um, this guideline, it also prescribes the process um, for the provision of letter authorization, how the project participants can submit the request, and also who are the relevant agencies, what are their mandates uh, in, with regard to this consideration. So we have um, the Office of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy and Planning, or ONIPT, um, who is the policy body uh, looking into um, the conformity of the project ideas uh, with the 
criteria for authorization. Uh, we also have the Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization uh, who have experience with voluntary uh, crediting mechanism looking into the technical details regarding to the MRE. So this is something that, that the, the institutional arrangement that we have um, within our own country. And uh, when we set up this kind of the, the arrangement and process to implement Article 6, I think we also look into what are the existing uh, mechanisms, standards, or infrastructure that we have that we can uh, adapt them to, to align with Article 6 and therefore uh, would not require to, to come up with, with new process. So we think this is important to, to look into what you have and then to see whether it can fit in within, within this new context. So um, maybe uh, next slide, please. So uh, within Thailand, since um, 2014, we have our own voluntary uh, carbon crediting mechanism called TVER Thailand Voluntary Emission Reduction Program, which have um, quite a number of projects already uh, being implemented. So what we do um, with regard to the underlying MRV standards for, project, for, for the pilot project and as well as um, what we foresee for future projects is to apply the, the standards that we have. But uh, we... Uh, from this year onward, we um, the we have from last year and and then it come into effect in this year is that we we improve on our standards, looking into the best practices, uh, best international practices, as well as the um, requirement from Article Six. So we have um, separate T word into two standards. The one, the standard one that we we implement since two thousand fourteen, and then we have the new one which we call the premium T word, uh, which come into effect. Um, this year um, that have some additional requirements regarding the um, additionality, uh, do no net harm, SDGs contributions, um, those kind of stuff that we think would be important um, to also take into consideration when we implement Article 6 projects. So this is something that, that we do and um, I think we have provided a link so if you are interested you can also um, look for, to, for further information on, on these um, premium t word standards. Okay, and um, the last slide. <laughs> so um, in terms of infrastructure, as we are implementing our own um, t -word program, we also have the registry to uh, issue the credits to track transactions and also um, the cancellation, retirement, um, th those kind of, um, those kind of uh, tracking system in place. Um, so what we do with this infrastructure as well is that we improve upon what we have and then to um, uh, to develop further on some features that we think would be beneficial to promote transparency and also to align uh, with what we see as a requirement under Article 6 with regard to the registry system. So uh, as you can see on, on the slide, um, this is the, the screenshot of our registry system and um, you can see the, the first pilot project with Switzerland, the Bangkok eBus program in this um, registry as well. And within this registry, you'll be able to assess the MADD, the mitigation activity design document, as well as the letter of authorization. So we are hoping to um, improve on the transparency and to ensure that this registry will be sufficient to, to serve the Article 6. So I, will, I think I will end there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, and um, so it looks uh, already very sophisticated. I'm uh, definitely uh, very curious to uh, go and check out the uh, carbon credit registry. <laughs> so thanks so much. Um, with that, let me now turn to our next speaker on your left, um, to uh, Simon um, Fellermeyer. <laughs> okay, good. That's also good. <laughs> then, uh, thank you, Simon. Then, um, yeah, I was a bit confused by the seating order, but uh, we, we go with our original program. Very good. So, then uh, let me welcome on the podium uh, Mr. Uh, Daniel Benefor from uh, the EPA uh, Ghana. And um, uh, Dr. Benefor, uh, of course, is also. Uh, a pioneer in Article 6 uh, implementation, um, so with a lot of experience uh, to share. Um, and um, so for you, um, the question is, uh, Ghana has already been 
um, well, the first country to, to authorize uh, Article 6 implementation. Could you share with us, uh, and has recently also published uh, the national framework uh, for Ghana, uh, could you share with us uh, what um, you experienced as, um, well, perhaps uh, yeah, lessons learned and uh, maybe also the challenges in, uh, in doing so? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I guess I'm not, um, I want to, um, 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 uh, maybe I'll turn it into questions. I think that's helpful for me. Mm -hmm. um, 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 but, but I think I, I, I want to thank the two speakers. I think they are doing very well. And we, I, I'm, I'm blown away by, 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 by what I've seen in Senegal and, 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 and in Thailand. Congrats to you. And thanks for, thanks for inviting us. Um, we have had the time to, <laughs> to be in the negotiation room with Simon and his people. And also how then do we, um, do we give meaning to the principles, the ideas, the expectations of the things that we agree in the negotiations room on the ground. And um, one very major lesson that we have learned is that it takes two things for it to happen. It takes, it takes a lot of, a lot of, a lot of will out of will, political will, and time and effort to translate it from, from, the, from, the, from the nice text that you see in the decisions and, 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 and how it is translated down to the ground. But one very important lesson that we have also learned is also that maybe our colleagues in the room in Bonn or in, in, in the corps tend not to appreciate the extent of the the essence of time that we merely have seven years to translate all that they are discussing or we are discussing in the room to implement and make meaning and benefit their people on the ground. And, and, and in our view in Ghana, we think that apart from the sophistications around carbon pricing instruments, it comes down to sustainable development, how do you deliver clean energy on the ground? How do you deliver access to better transportation? How do you do that? Time is of essence. And that is what we've learned. The other major point I wanted to highlight is that the, we have learned that the bad experiences of the market in the past also influencing how you can engage at the national level. And let, and let me give you some numbers. I think Perspectives or another uh, body had launched a study, and the study said that in Africa, as of 2020 or so, there were only 227 CDM projects that have been registered, not is issuing credits, registered. 70% of this number were in four countries, right? in South Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, and I think Egypt. So the rest of us, we're sharing the remaining 15 or 20 percent. And my country had only four CDM projects registered. None of it could, could, could issue. Right? We had 22 POAs and 21 VCMs. Those, were, those ones were the ones that redeemed our image. So we were given the mandate to make it, to make it happen, that we should not give an excuse that we missed the train. So how do, we, how do we make sure that as we are even negotiating the Article 6 and nobody knew how it would look like, we decided to take a, take a bold step with our colleagues in, 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 on the source side, that how do we do things differently so that we can make it work for Ghana? And not to, only to meet our NDC target or raise the ambition but also show that it can work and it can make businesses really make meaningful benefit out of it and at the same time help deliver the benefit that the people of Ghana needs. So, so that, these are the questions that we need to, we are supposed to answer to the political authorities. And in that respect, we, we have to ask ourselves some very four basic questions. Did we have to have an NDC before we can engage in, in Article 6 co voluntary corporations? The answer was yes. 
did we have to have a bilateral cooperation before we can authorize, in our view? The answer was no. But how do we do that? Because Article 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3 clearly imposes the provisions for cooperating with other Paris Agreement parties and also ensuring that even whilst you are cooperating, you must promote development, you must ensure there's environmental integrity, but, but above all, ensure that there is application of a robust accounting system. So these were the principles that we thought we have to put in place before we can engage in cooperative approaches. So in our view, we didn't have to have a national framework in place before we can start to cooperate. But how then do we deal with the principles as articulated in 6162 and 6.3? And that led us to put in place what we called a provisional arrangement whilst we are cooperating with others. Next question. Did we have to have a national radio system before a complex one or a simple one or none before we can, we can cooperate? In our view, the rule was simple. According to the rules, you must either have access to or have a radio, a radio system. So you can either have it yourself or have access to. So we didn't have to have one on our own. We must show that we can have access to that. So because in our view, many countries um, are not taking step to take advantage of this because of the fact that they need to have all the complex things in place. The last, the last answer that we had to answer, provide is that what type of national arrangement must we put in place to be able to authorize? And that was a very important necessity for us that how do we show that we have a national arrangement in place before we can authorize? And that became very important to put in place a national institutional arrangement to inform the procedures for authorization, when to authorize, how to authorize, when to revoke the authorization, how much you can authorize, and the consequences for not meeting the authorization requirement, and also the reporting as it could be triggered by authorization. So we needed to do that. And that was the basis of our work. But to end my conversation is that, in our view, one of the most important things that you have learned is that you can put in place a very complex national arrangement. But think about the sustainability of that. Who pays for that? Who manages that? And to us, that is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and uh, congratulations uh, for all of your bold uh, decisions, <laughs> Garnet's bold decisions in uh, moving ahead, and then uh, I guess also uh, showing others uh, the way, uh, how it can be done. Um, with that, let me now uh, invite uh, Simon, Simon Fellermeyer, who is a climate policy advisor um, of the Swiss uh, Federal Office for the Environment, or FÖN. And, um, well, I guess uh, Switzerland uh, has been a first uh, in many respects already. So uh, it's the first country to submit its uh, NDC. Probably the um, first, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was not <laughs> And uh, was the first, uh, I think this one you can confirm, to uh, sign a bilateral agreement with the, yes? Um, and now, um, well, recently, the first one to submit an initial report, yes, and um, uh, certainly also involved in many first authorizations, as we have seen now from uh, Thailand and uh, Ghana. Uh, so the question to you would be, um, what are some of your key takeaways from uh, these very first processes of um, initial report drafting and uh, the authorizations as you witness them? Thank you so much for the invitation, also for yeah being here. It's a, it's actually called Kamin Zimmer, so it's a chimney room, and I can tell you with the lights on you, it is uh, pretty warm. So f forgive me for not wearing a jacket, but uh, I also want to just uh, start by congratulating well all the others that that spoke before me, and I think this uh, it, it's it's weird if you give yourself a joint congratulation. But I think you know what we see on this panel here is that it can be done, right? And that's something that I think just two years ago was really not that evident, because we were, of course, in this in this phase, as as was mentioned by the previous speakers, of discussing in very uncertain terms these negotiations. Now there's a lot of clarity, and and I think we also really recognize jointly that this 
has completely changed the mood and the willingness and the ability of countries to say, yes, we're taking these bold steps, we're doing concrete activities, and, and we're getting this done. Um, and I think that that state of slowly transitioning from this negotiation style to an implementation style is, is, is still not completed. So we're still in this transition phase where, of course, we know there's currently an event ongoing of actual negotiations. There are several aspects in, in the guidance that will make cooperation even easier if it's even clearer what you can do, what kind of services are actually provided by the by the UN Climate Change Secretariat in terms of registries, in terms of clarity on reporting, the formats. So there are some things that still need to fall in place, but there are several things that are already very clear, and I think that that are kind of the basic requirements before you can actually move, and now we can, I think, and that, that's what we see here, we can clearly move and we are moving. So I think that's, that's great, and we c encourage you know, others to move as well. And also, on that note, you know, thank you for, for the interest. Um, so I think what, what have we learned? I just keep coming back to the fact that it is a transition phase. It's a learning by doing. So indeed, we have, we have signed these agreements. I think there we've, we've, come to, we've come to find a way to do this. And at the same time, I think also, as we heard from Daniel, the more guidance there is from the multilateral room, the fewer need there is to clarify the outstanding elements. And that's, in the end, what the bilateral agreement does. But a key point, also, I can totally confirm from the learning we heard before, is that what these bilateral agreements do is a key requirement. It generates that polit political attention and political momentum, which is totally necessary, right, to anchor this, because these are, in the end, big and fundamental decisions that impact your NDC, but that should also be perfectly anchored, wherever that's possible, um, into the implementation of your NDC. And you f need to find a way jointly, but I think especially driven from, of course, by the perspective of the host country, to, to, to make that work for you, to make that work for sustainable development, and, and to, to use markets in order to actually, well, get to a higher climate action. Then, I mean, you know, I think it's funny, in the negotiations, like, uh, several people are congratulating us on being the first. I think if you're first, the likelihood of doing something wrong is very high, or, like, people criticizing you. So, uh, you know, we look forward to that criticism, but I think so far it, it has actually worked. It also works for the negotiation room. Like, we're discussing authorization statements and whether there can be changes, and at least, you know, there's one voice that can say, oh, you know, we have try to do it like this. For now, it seems fine. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll discover something else. But I think this is, that is a mutual learning. And it also flows, again, back from the negotiation room into the implementation and the other way around. It's a two-way street. And, and I think the other thing that we've learned is that, and I can say that both for 6.2 and for 6.4, that setting this up is hard. You know, the, we are essentially in bilateral cooperation setting up a crediting standard to some degree every single time, which is kind of a very absurd thing to do. But you know, I think that's, that's, that's where we are. And at the same time, I happen to sit on the supervisory body of the 6-4 mechanism. That is just as hard. You know? And so I think that goes again back to Daniel's other point, with the, it really requires a lot of time and effort. Uh, both the political, I think, commitment for this, but then time and effort. And of course, the good thing is this will get easier over time as you keep learning. But um, it's good to see that there's so many, so many motivated people in the room and on the panel. And so I think what we learn is primarily it can be done. And with that, back to you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Simon. And of course, um, uh, we are all in this together, but uh, we very much appreciate uh, our front runners who help us uh, uh, address some of the uh, tricky issues. Um, we will now have a change of seats. So please join me in uh, giving one more round of applause to our great uh, panelists. <laughs>
And also, uh, as uh, Simon mentioned, um, thank them again very much to spend the time here with us in the event, given that um, there's a tough competition and including some negotiations uh, were still going on. So thanks again. <laughs> so maybe Mbayu can go all the way to the end. Yeah, do that here. And then in the middle, Simon Idrisas. Oh, we need to. Um, Simon, can you pass Idrisas' uh, name, please? In the middle. Oh, yes, he's here. Great. So we will um, now change uh, to. Um, private sector and uh, project developers in Article 6 and uh, learn from them about uh, lessons learned and uh, key challenges in implementing this article on the ground. Um, and the uh, panelists, the distinguished panelists that we have are uh, actually also operating in um, the same countries that uh, we had on the panel already uh, in the first session. Um, so first, I have the pleasure to invite uh, Ms. Janina Schnick. Uh, she is um, a project manager uh, at the foundation My Climate, um, which is developing uh, projects for both voluntary carbon markets as well as um, uh, compliance markets, um, and has, for example, been uh, involved in an e-mobility program in Senegal. But I think uh, Janina will tell us a bit uh, more about the type of uh, projects that uh, my climate is uh, doing. And so uh, to you also the question, what are your experiences and uh, perhaps what are the challenges in developing an Article 6 program? Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, and thank you to the government of Senegal and uh, the Click Foundation for giving us the opportunity to share some of uh, the work that we've been doing in um, the pioneer countries that are working on Article 6. Um, so as Sandra said, um, my climate has been working in the voluntary carbon market for many years. We've supported or developed over 170 projects in 45 countries, but we're now working closely with the Click Foundation to work on um, Article 6 programs. Um, so to just illustrate a little bit um, sort of the challenges we face, but also the successes that we've had, um, I brought to you a couple of examples of programs that we're working on. We've already heard about um, this one. So uh, we're working with the government of Senegal to develop an e-mobility project um, in Dakar, which um, for those who've been to Dakar, they know um, those colorful car rapide, they're, they're buses, they're um, really an iconic sort of part of the public transport um, system in Dakar. And um, the project's looking to replace the engines of those diesel-fueled buses with um, solar-powered um, electric engines um, and also establish a solar station network where these buses can exchange or charge their batteries. Um, in terms of scale, we're looking at um, up to 300,000 tons of CO2 reduced by um, 2030 and we're looking to start implementing next year. Um, and our local partner is Mandu um, Consulting as well as um, a local consortium of all the stakeholders involved um, that we've set up. Um, so then we have a couple of examples. Next slide, please. Um, have a couple of examples from Georgia. Um, Georgia has also been very active in um, developing their infrastructure to implement Article 6 programs. Um, and we're working with the government there to um, look at energy efficient heating for rural households. Um, so this would be a combination of fuel efficient stoves, um, solar water heaters, and also thermal insulation to improve energy efficiency. Um, and our local partner there is um, Women Engaged for a Common Future, WECF. Um, and again, would be looking to start implementing next year. Um, and then the other idea focuses on um, using biomass, um, which there's a big market for in, in the country of Georgia from agriculture in particular. Um, and um, we're still working on the details there, but it's looking at stoves and how to make products that can be used for renewable energy, so pellets and, and briquettes from biomass um, as well. And here we're working with SEN, which is the Caucasus Environmental NGO Network. Next slide, please. 
Um, so then recently we've also started partnering with Thailand, and of course we've already heard that Thailand has a lot of its infrastructure for Article 6 in, in place already. Um, here we are partnering with uh, Varuna, um, who have already implemented a pilot project in alternate wetting and drying um, in the central and uh, northern provinces. Um, at the moment, this is fairly small, but the idea would be um, to scale this up to 120,000 hectares in 15 provinces, um, both using this alternate wetting and drying technology, but also um, improved water management through SRI um, and DSR. Um, and here, we're also looking to um, obviously work with the local infrastructure that's already in place. So in terms of challenges, um, I think a lot has already been said by the previous panelists. Um, one thing that we're really noticing is that we, I think the panel is very aptly named pioneer countries because we are pioneering. There's a lot of things that are still evolving, a lot of um, rules that are not in place yet and we're learning by doing. And of course, um, time is of the essence. Um, so um, it is often, we're often finding ourselves um, readapting and having to be quite flexible. Um, but everyone is, all the stakeholders are, and so I think it has worked quite well so far. Of course, this comes with differing requirements in different countries as well. Of course, it's completely legitimate that different countries are making different systems, but from the perspective of a, um, a developer, there's no one-size-fits-all, and so this requires additional flexibility from our side. Um, I'd also say that the complexity of those projects is quite high, um, especially if we look at a program like in, in Dakar. This is the first time that something like an EBUS project has been done in Sub-Saharan Africa of this kind. We're doing it for the first time, and so this comes with both new technologies but also new business models. Um, we're having to adapt those from the ones that we know, and sometimes that comes with different financing requirements. Um, and I think we also heard this earlier, they're often less attractive to investors. And so I think there's also probably something to be said for a, a new perspective on investments in climate finance that is necessary to, to make these projects happen. Um, yeah, I think I'll finish here. Fascinating. Um, thank you very much, uh, Janina. And I, I'm uh, personally um, uh, very happy to hear that the nice, colorful buses uh, seem to stay this way and they just get more and more <laughs> efficient engine. I think that's a wonderful solution. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now I'm happy to uh, turn uh, to um, Mr. Idrissa Diasa in uh, Senegal. I hope, uh, Idrissa, you can, uh, you can hear me well and uh, that um, we, in a moment, will also be able to hear uh, you well, yes, you're, we can already see you uh, on our screen. Um, so Mr. Idrissa is um, with uh, Sonajet, which is um, the national um, integrated waste management company of uh, Senegal. And he's uh, involved in some important uh, waste management um, programs and Article 6 um, pilot initiatives in um, uh, Senegal. And. Um, uh, <clears throat> Idrissa, can you tell us a bit more about these? And uh, same question as uh, Janina, what uh, may be the challenges that you're encountering? Yes, thank you very much. And I hope you are hearing me well. Great. Um, uh, thank, you very, thank you very much uh, for having this opportunity to, uh, to share uh, with you uh, in this um, side event. Um, the challenges we are facing here in Senegal, uh, according to the implementation of Article 6. But before that, uh, let me just um, tell you about Sonajet. Um, Sonajet is the national entity um, dedicated to waste management in Senegal. Uh, we have a hybrid status. We are a private company, but by but for now, 100% uh, um, uh, shared by the government. So. Um, uh, this uh, put us in a specific way where we behave as a private company, but still in the uh, rules of the of national companies. Um, uh, do you hear me? We hear Great. you excellently. Um, um, uh, so um, um, before I'm, I will try to break down the challenges, um, let me just um, uh, try to translate this French spirit of are talking about uh, um, uh, agreements where we say that spirit, spirit um, um, over the letters. Uh, it means that if we talk about the, the, the cooperative approach uh, around uh, Article 6, 
um, uh, for us, the spirit is that it has to be a win-win situation where uh, the buyers countries, um, uh, let's say, uh, use this mechanism to to fulfill their 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 need as well as the the sellers countries as I mean in general uh, from the the global south um, I use it to to put the humanity in the herd of all the projects and 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 creating um, this opportunity of wealth of creating jobs and having impact uh, in 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 the humanity globally. So um, where we 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 design the projects, we have this in mind that everything we have to do have to have an impact, right? And 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 this comes to 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 these challenges we are facing. Um, the regulatory the regulatory challenges um, is, is is there. Uh, normally, because we are in a learning by doing process, the implementation of an Article 6 program requires strict adherence to a wide array of local, national, and international regulation. And these rule, these rules uh, encompass environmental standards and waste management practices, and the process of carbon credits as well. And 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 it is really clear that we are benefiting. From the Minister of Environment, we already have this framework uh, who, who was been uh, presented. In the waste management sector, we are trying to build um, um, some compost plan and, and biogas plan, generally uh, organic waste treatment facilities and plastic as well, uh, recycling uh, facilities in order to, 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 to have uh, uh, benefits of, uh, of, of these opportunities as we are seeing it, because we are seeing it as opportunities. The second challenge is the lack of technical expertise. Implementing an Article 6 program in the waste management sector requires a high level of technical expertise. Um, the, the strategy Sonajad has taken is that we partnered with Alcott, Alcott uh, 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 which is um, 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 a private company, but dedicated to this type of, of things. You know that in Senegal right now, I mean, we are not really custom in, in having um, uh, waste management um, uh, integrated into our, 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 our way of thinking and planning. And you just have a guy which is called the climate guy in the company, right? So um, uh, it is not really, you know, something uh, where we have a big expertise. So we need uh, some type of this type of company to be a partner with them and then to 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 give because th there is a lot of expertise and capacity building uh, over here as a conference. The financial conference as well, uh, because establishing such type of program can be costly and require significant up upfront investment in infrastructure. Um, right now, we are glad because um, we have this uh, uh, partnership with Carbon Growth. Uh, this is the time as well uh, for us to to, to really thank them for, for their confidence uh, to make an upfront finance uh, for, for one at least one project, pilot project. And then uh, we, we, we hopefully we will have some investors come in uh, for these upfront um, approaches to help us leverage the financial barrier. We can talk about the market readiness. We can talk about as well the coordination with the government because we have to high, uh, enhance the transparency, talking about MRV and want as well to be frontliner in the in the in the digital digital MRV as well. So there are challenges. It is really um, 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 excite, ex exciting uh, at the same time because we are pioneer. We have to be uh, at the same time, you know, um, really um, like aware of things are going on the negotiation are, are going on and when we talk about article 6 it is article 6.2 but we have as well a project in article 6.8 where we don't have any clarity of 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 of, of the international policies going on so uh, generally that's what i wanted to share and and for us um um having the expertise by partner partnering with technical uh, people uh, dedicated to the subject having upfront financing is like the the key uh, to go forward and really benefits uh, uh, for our community uh, from this mechanism thank you very much excellent uh, thank you so much Edi. and uh, we really miss you here in bonn but uh, glad to <laughs> at least uh... yes unfortunately as you might, as you might know we have each um, challenge we have i mean and unfortunately, this political crisis is going on in Dakar, and then I prefer to 
stay by my family. It was mm. like a, a choice. But my heart and my spirit is all over there, Thank for you. sure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And uh, we hope uh, for the best that uh, the situation comes down. Yes, hopefully as well. Thank you very yes. much for the, for, for the opportunity. Yes. Great. So um, let me then uh, invite our next speaker, um, Ms. Juliana Kessler from uh, Perspectives, um, who is doing great work in Article 6 and including um, also uh, supporting um, uh, a green cooling program in Ghana. So we, we are curious to hear a bit uh, more about it, um, what you're doing there and what may be success factors or challenges. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandra. And perhaps before jumping into the success factors, like I give a brief overview of the Ghana Green Cooling Program. Um, so Ghana has a high demand for cooling uh, due to its tropical climate, growing population, and also the increasing urbanization and electrification. And this has also resulted in a sharp increase uh, for demand for air conditioners. And on the other hand, the air conditioning sector is significantly contributing to Ghana's GHG emissions. So this is why we at Perspectives, together with the German Development Corporation, GIZ, CLIC, and um, also the Ghanaian government, have been developing the Ghana Green Cooling Program. And it aims um, yeah, to promote uh, the introduction um, of um, so-called uh, um, efficient split air conditioners um, by, uh, that use propane, so R290, and this is basically a natural refrigerant uh, with um, a, um, a sign or like an eligibly, um, an eligi eligibly low um, global warming um, potential. And yeah, the goal is really to um, install 150,000 um, of these green split air conditioners um, by 2030. And um, this will be accompanied also by capacity building and technical measures with an estimated em emission reduction potential of almost 500,000 tons of CO2 uh, equivalent by 2030. And yeah, currently, um, basically, um, yeah, the program um, is... Um, waiting to, to undergo um, validation and then hopefully also the authorization by the host country. Um, so now coming to your actual question, the success factors. I mean, the two key success factors were really um, um, Ghana's pioneering role in the operationalization of the Article 6.2 cooperation and then also the strong cooperation between the involved actors in the program. Um, I mean, we have heard from Daniel already that, you know, Ghana had really this early commitment to establish an Article 6 framework, and this set the strong foundation for this program. The framework really provides, like, a comprehensive compen compendium of uh, processes and requirements for Article 6.2 activities, including methodological requirements for additionality, for example, and another key aspect is, for example, the whitelist. So, you know, it's, it's, it's clear what are the eligible activities for an Article 6.2 cooperation. And then the second um, key success factor I mentioned was the really um, strong collaboration um, of the Ghanaian government with uh, key stakeholders, specifically like private sector actors, so by engaging with importers and retailers um, yeah, that has really led to conceptualizing a, vi a viable approach that also f um, meets the needs of these stakeholders. And I stop here. Thanks a lot, uh, Juliana. Um, and now I'd like to turn to um, uh, one of our hosts of uh, this event, to uh, Ursula flossmann Kraus, who's... Um, Carbon Procurement Manager at uh, Click, whom you all know is a very active um, buyer in the uh, carbon market and in Article 6. And uh, Ulla, to you specifically the question, um, so what is now, you've already engaged in a number of uh, question, uh, countries, but uh, what is your portfolio development uh, strategy? And perhaps uh, especially with regards to our um, or your side event uh, partner, Senegal. 
Probably. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for the question. And yeah, if you could move to the next slide, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah so the Click Foundation is the carbon offset grouping of the Swiss transport fuel importers who have an um, obligation, offset obligation under the Swiss CO2 law, and we fulfill that obligation on their behalf by procuring internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, or short, ITMOs. And to this end, the Click Foundation develops greenhouse gas uh, mitigation programs in countries that have signed a bilateral cooperation agreement with Switzerland. And those programs um, need to yeah, increase mitigation ambition, but they also need to comply with the national frameworks, both of Switzerland and the host country, as uh, Juliana just rightly pointed out. And um, to your question, in terms of uh, uh, strategies to develop a portfolio of um, Article 6.2 programs, we um, follow our twofold approach, so to say, both bottom up and top down. That means we do invite interested parties to submit uh, program proposals, ideas to us. We also discuss with um, the partner countries of Switzerland what are their priorities in terms of sectors, subsectors, activities. And specifically, um, with regards to our co host of this event, um, to Senegal, we have actually recently um, updated and specified our terms of reference and are relaunching our call for proposals and uh, it will be on this website very soon and we do invite uh, interested companies or also um, public sector entities to yeah, submit ideas to us and we are very happy to take a look and develop them further. And yeah, I'll leave it with that. So we have a bit of time left. Back, back to Sandra, thank you. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> Yeah, and uh, last but uh, not least, I have the great pleasure of uh, inviting uh, Elachi Mbai Dion, who is uh, actually also a director of Afrique Energie Environnement. And uh, Mbai, as you know, is active on many fronts. So he's uh, uh, both uh, uh, at the forefront of uh, the rulemaking as uh, vice chair of the Super Article 64 supervisory body. Uh, as well as uh, lead negotiator of uh, the African group of negotiators. Um, but Mbai also knows firsthand the challenges of uh, negotiating bilateral agreements and uh, developing uh, programs as, uh, in his support of um, the bilateral agreement between, or the cooperation between uh, Switzerland and uh, uh, Senegal. Uh, so to you, Mbai, uh, the question perhaps just binding it together from the rulemaking and uh, seeing what's, uh, what are the challenges on the ground. Uh, could you reflect and share with us your thoughts on uh, where do countries now need to focus on to make all these uh, rules uh, operational on the ground? Where do you see the main uh, capacity building needs and priorities? Thank you. And is it working? Yeah, thank you and good morning, colleagues. And uh, I think uh, Paplamin has already presented the situation in Senegal uh, when it comes to the carbon market area. Uh, Senegal is, was act, is active in the CDM the last years, as well as in the voluntary market. And uh, the rules under Article 6 are completely different than the ones we had in the previous carbon markets. So it was first needed for the different stakeholders, starting from the decision makers, but also the other stakeholders to know the new rules under Article 6. So we needed to have a very large awareness program uh, within the different stakeholders to know the new rules in relation to that because they, are, they were in the previous markets. And we were also approached by many partners like Switzerland, Japan, Singapore, Norway, and uh, recently Korea to see if we can have this uh, uh, partnership in meeting our NDCs in the, uh, through the international cooperation. We started the negotiation as run, uh, the, the first 
like Ghana in, in West Africa. And we signed those contracts uh, with uh, Switzerland and an MOU with Japan. But uh, we realized that uh, to be effective in the market and meet all the rules, it uh, was necessary to have a stop and better appreciate the situation and uh, try to better to, to have a better knowledge on what we want exactly to be when involved in this uh, carbon market, the new ones. What are the our obligation? What are the challenges? Uh, how the, the different stakeholders can benefit from that? And based on all of that, we uh, build what we call a strategy for Article 6 implementation, under which we have first assess the state of the carbon market in Senegal, the relationship between the carbon market and our NDC, what we expect from the carbon market to meet our NDC and our future NDCs, and also what are the expectations of the different stakeholders within the country, because uh, as I said, we were active in the CDM where we had not uh, commitments, but uh, many private sectors benefited from the carbon market because we have seen the recent years many projects in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the energy sector as PPPs in the energy sector that have provided uh, uh, energy within the country with, uh, connected to the grid. We uh, needed to know what will be the different connection between all of that. And also, we needed to assess what will be the potential when it comes to Article 6, because there are some different rules, the corresponding adjustment, and all of that is completely different than the situation we had. And based on all of that, uh, we uh, try to define what will be the potential in Article 6 that has been done defining the different sectors and subsectors, as well as uh, the, 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 the governance that is needed, because we will need uh, a new governance to, to, because as I said, we need uh, to have the corresponding adjustment. Every international transfer mitigation outcome will have an implication in our ability to, to meet our NDC, bearing in mind that we had both uh, conditional and unconditional NDC. And based on all of that, we developed and submitted to the decision makers what needed to be the new the strategy for implementing effectively an Article 6 within the country. And we are sharing that with the different stakeholders to be in a better situation to define the activities, the positive list, and all the requirements that are needed. And also, and most important, the reporting elements and the tracking to be included in the global reporting elements of the Paris Agreement. And all of that uh, are ongoing and uh, is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all uh, panelists again. And uh, just before closing this event, uh, I want to make two announcements. Um, so one, uh, a little bit of uh, marketing for another very interesting side event, um, which is hosted by um, uh, VCMI, the Voluntary Carbon Market Initiative and uh, Climate Focus, um, later this afternoon in the Dorint Hotel. Uh, it is on the links between VCMs, NDCs, and Article 6, in case you're interested. Please be welcome to join at um, the Dorint Hotel from 2.30 to 4.30. Um, if you can make it a little bit earlier, there will also be lunch at 1.30. So you can come to me for more information. <laughs> and um, uh, the other announcement, unfortunately, um, the bell is uh, just going off. We've run out of time for um, uh, questions. Um, but the good news is um, there's uh, coffee uh, being served. So I'd uh, like to invite you to take your questions and uh, 
uh, to our panelists who hopefully can join us for a little bit uh, longer as well. And then, um, yeah, I invite you all to, to have uh, uh, bilateral discussions and please enjoy your coffee. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. At one also, we will have this uh, 6.4 supervisory body. <laughs>